the second axis is the one that casts the rays out themselves. I got interested in locks back when I was working at my magic act at university. I had the idea that I could build in some escapology as well, so I typed the word handcuffs into a few search engines and sat back to collate what came up. I learned a lot from that exercise. I thought more about the outer limits of consensual sex than about escapology. <laughs> then Jimmy, the barman at the Walsh Pony on Lost the Green, mentioned the guy that he knew, Tom Wilk, the Banbury bandit, who just finished a two year stretch for breaking and entering. They did it on two dozen specimen counts, with about 100 more taken into consideration, sent him down to Bollingham. He'd be the man, Jimmy said, any kind of lot. He, can, he says he can knock them off blindfold. I was young enough to find the thought of chatting to a career criminal appealing, so I asked Jimmy for the guy's address. Jimmy said he'd have to set it up first, and he left me to stew for about a week. I went in there every night to ask him if he'd seen Wilk and if he'd asked him about me, but the answer was always no. And then one night it was a different answer, it was sod off. Sorry, Fix, Jimmy said apologetically. He's not himself since he got out of jail. He's gone very quiet, doesn't want to talk to anyone or have anyone around. Maybe it's just something he's going through. I'll ask him again in a few months. But I couldn't wait that long. I had to be doing it now. I worked on Jimmy until he gave me Walk's address just to get rid of me. And I went round to see the man myself. Tom Wilk lived in a flat on some grubby estate off the ring road, three floors up with no lift. It was eerily silent, as if the whole, whole place was empty. No kids on the stairs, no music, blaring out of open windows, even though it was high summer. I knocked on the door and waited. Knocked and waited some more. When it was clear that no one was going to answer, I turned around to leave. Just as I got to the stairs, I heard a sound that made me pause. A sob, somebody crying. I listened for a minute or so, and it came again. From behind the door, I just knocked on it heartbroken, strangled sob. I went back and tried the door. It opened. Fortune favours the pure of heart and the brassy of balls. <laughs> Inside, a hallway just two steps wide, then an open door that led through into a pub the living room, cramped despite the fact that there was almost no furniture there. A middle-aged man with a shock of white hair and a bill so spare he looked malnourished was sitting in a spanning g plan dining chair by the light of a bare bowl, with tears running down his cheeks. I thought at first that the curtains were drawn, but they weren't. It was just that the windows were covered in smeary black ash, so thick that even the light from a street lamp right outside could barely filter through them. Floor, walls, furniture, everything else in the room except for the man himself was similarly covered. Tom Walk was so drunk that he couldn't even stand up. And when I knelt next to the chair, his eyes could barely focus on me. He had no idea who I was, but my sudden appearance didn't seem to phase or anger him. He pleaded with me, his free hand pouring up my sleeve. In the other hand, he was gripping a bottle of Grant's whiskey with about a quarter of its contents left. His breath stank like a distillery. I, I always, I always lock the door, he said, so they don't notice I've been in. It takes them long, but I always lock the door. Since his own door hadn't been locked or bolted, that puzzled me for a moment. Then I realised he wasn't talking about this door. Never hurt anyone, Walk was mumbling now, shaking his head in pain and disbelief. Never carry a knife, a gun, anything. Colin said keep five quid worth of change in a sock and whack him on the head if they get bossy. No, no, I never did it. I never needed to. In and out, me. In and out every time. I ran my hands along the arm of the chair, which was as greasily filthy with ash as everything else in the room. Then I looked at the tips of my fingers. Clean. I went to make some coffee, but it was for me, not for Wilk. He finished off the whiskey, and I pieced together the story from his stop start ramblings, although sometimes his tears made him completely incomprehensible. One of the houses he'd robbed just before he'd gone inside had been a semi down on Blackbird Lees. A shabby looking place, but a mate of his who worked for UPS had told him the bloke who lived there took deliveries for his hi fi store at home sometimes. There was a chance of a good take, and Wilk had borrowed a van for the night. It took him ages to find the place. It was on one of those godforsaken tracks that seemed to be built on some sort of fractal system with endless identical streets opening off each other and feeding back into each other, so you're lost before you start. 
But he found it at last. And getting inside was easy. It would have been as sweet as a nut. Except that there was nothing there. Not just no hi-fi kit, nothing worth taking at all. In one of the bedrooms, a kid in a cot, heavily asleep all by itself. No jewellery, no money, no portable electronic stuff. Even the TV had a cracked case in, so nobody was going to touch it. So he left again, as quietly as he'd come, pissed off and bitter and rehearsing the word he was going to have with his UPS wallet. So he was basically running an automatic. He locked the front door behind him, forgetting that it hadn't been locked when he arrived. He wrote the night off. He went home. He went to bed. The next morning, in the Oxford Mail, he read that a two-year-old had burned to death in a house on Blackbird Leaf. The address, which he'd spent so long trying to find the night before, jumped out at him from the page. There couldn't be any possibility of a mistake. He couldn't get in. Wolf mumbled, his rambling despair going on and on in an endless loop. They came back and the house was on fire. How the fuck? Nothing. I don't understand it. I didn't, I didn't touch anything, did I? But they couldn't get in. The door was locked and nobody had a key when they got there. It was all burned down. He whined like a wounded animal. The whiskey bottle fell out of his hand and rolled across the floor as Wolf covered his eyes and rocked and moaned through clenched teeth. It was about a week, maybe as long as two, before it started to happen. He wasn't even in his own place the first time. He was at a cafe, eating a bacon sandwich and talking to a couple of likely lads about a possible warehouse job, pretending it was business as usual. When inside, he kept hearing a kid crying in an empty house, and he couldn't concentrate on what anyone was saying for more than a sentence at a time. <coughs> Black ash began to settle on the table, on his plate on the men he was talking to. He jumped up with a shout of curse, which made the other two geezers look at him as though he was insane. He responded aggressively, were they blind or something? And things got unpleasant. Wolf realized that nobody except him could see the ash. Then he ran his hand through it and realized why that was. The haunting had continued ever since. He'd never seen an actual ghost. It was just that wherever he was, the ash would start to fall. And the longer he stayed in one place, the thicker it got. It was even in his dreams, so that avenue of escape was barred. After a few weeks, he was thinking about suicide, but he talked to a priest and gave himself up to the police instead. He provided them with a list of the houses, offices, and warehouses he'd burgled, with the Black Bear Leeds address at the top of the list. He told them everything they needed to know to bring a case, and when they did, standing in the dock in a rain of ash that nobody else could see, he pleaded guilty on all counts. He thought it would stop them. He thought he'd done enough to atone, but nothing changed, and he knew now that nothing ever would. He was using alcohol to blunt the horror, and when alcohol stopped working, then he'd probably go back to option air and do himself in. My emotions, as I listened to this, were ricocheting around like rubber bullets inside a dumpster. What the man had done was horrendous, unforgivable. Everything he'd suffered he deserved, ten times over. But he hadn't set out to kill anybody. He just made a stupid mistake, and then tried his best to pay for it, only to discover that he was facing a life sentence without appeal. I stood over him and judged him guilty, then innocent, then guilty again, before finally reaching the only conclusion I could, that it wasn't my call. I think there's another way out of this, Tom, I told him. I think we can help each other. It took about a week of sleeping on his floor and sitting in his death-dark room every day before I finally got a scent of the little ghost that was hiding in all that sifting ash. Such a huge weight of fear and despair from such a tiny source. I caught its attention with nursery rhymes, the grand old Duke of York, the old woman tossed up in a basket, boys and girls came out to play. After that it was easy. The light broke through the ash as I played on my tin whistle and the room resumed its normal colours. When I finished, all that greasy, granular pain was gone. A scream that had addressed itself to the eye instead of the ear had stopped echoing at last. I felt exhausted. I felt compromised and sleazy and black with ash that couldn't be seen anymore. I got up to go, but Wolf wouldn't let me. He was in my debt, and with gratitude as extreme as his earlier grief, he insisted on paying. He took me through every kind of lock there was, starting with simple levers and wards, 
then working through tumbler, pin, wafer, and disc, before finishing off with ultra modern master key systems, which are about as relevant to astrophology as depleted uranium shells are to the game of darts. <laughs> I lapped it up. I was the best pupil he ever had, and the first, and the last. He got religion after that, and took holy orders. I never saw him again. <laughs>